now we're going to look at what events happened for John F. Kennedy's presidency following the failed Bay of Pigs invasion that we discussed in class. On the screen here you can see a list of events that covered Kennedy's short presidency until he was assassinated and the very beginning of his vice president who became president, Lyndon Johnson. Of course you've got the Bay of Pigs failure which we talked about. Following that are the subject of this recording, the Vienna summit which was supposed to be a meeting to produce a lot of progress on issues such as Germany. However, it failed due to the weakness that we had just experienced and the humiliation at the Bay of Pigs. This led to the creation of the Berlin Wall in August of 1961. Um, these other issues we'll discuss in class and in future recordings, but this is just basically the overview of what happened in these three years covering Kennedy's presidency. Now let's look at the Vienna Summit, which was planned for early June 1961, just a month and a half after the Bay of Pigs failed invasion, which humiliated our country and John F. Kennedy greatly. Of all of the Cold War summit meetings, which were these meetings between the superpowers to try to make progress on serious Cold War issues, this one was the most unfortunate. The participants got along very badly, and misperceptions growing out of their talks led to two major crises, one in Berlin, which resulted in the construction of the wall and the closest that the world came to nuclear warfare, which was the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. In the two years that followed this Vienna summit in 1961, war between the superpowers was a very real possibility. Let's look at the differences between Kennedy and Khrushchev, who were the leaders of our two countries at the time. Not only did they speak different languages in and of itself, they spoke different political languages. Kennedy was... Um, a pragmatic type of a guy who considered ideological motivated people to be impractical. He had watched Khrushchev try to maneuver on the world stage and judged Khrushchev to be basically uh, that type of a person who was an actor. Khrushchev, he recognized that politics was a merciless business that he could be pretty ruthless at. However, at times he also expressed an idealistic faith in Marxism. This faith that he had had in Marxism is what allowed him to lift out of poverty and rise to the top position in the Soviet Union. It was also what he thought was, thought was the wave of the future, which would eventually triumph over capitalism. And at the beginning of his leadership of the Soviet Union, that's why he expressed hopes for peaceful coexistence, because he assumed that the capitalist system was inherently weak and would collapse at some point anyway, so why risk going to war? Kennedy's first big error was in thinking that Khrushchev was just as skeptical of grand designs as he was. Then, when he realized that that wasn't the case, he thought that he could argue ideology with the Soviet leader, and the result was a series of talks that were very tense and basically downright hostile towards each other. The first issue they discussed was obviously what had just happened in Cuba. Kennedy was pretty much in an awkward spot because of the failed Bay of Pigs invasion, but Khrushchev actually took a detached view of it. You would think that he would be outraged at what we had tried to do to Castro because we assumed him to be a close ally of Castro's. But Castro, according to Khrushchev, was not a true Marxist, no matter what he said. And Cuba, in Khrushchev's view, was no more of a threat to the U.S. than Turkey was. And Turkey was a place that the U.S. had placed missiles of a nuclear nature and other types of forces supposedly for their protection against the Soviets. So Khrushchev was trying to make the point that we shouldn't be worried about Cuba if they shouldn't be worried about Turkey. So on the surface Khrushchev didn't really seem to care about what happened with Cuba but underneath the surface Khrushchev knew that that could be a very good tool that he could use on Kennedy to try to get what he wanted with the next main issue that was to be discussed which was Berlin. Because of Kennedy's failure, Khrushchev basically assumed that he would not stand up to him, that, that Kennedy wouldn't stand up to Khrushchev when it came to Berlin, like Eisenhower had, and Stalin had done. In 1958, Khrushchev had given up the idea of a reunited and neutralized Germany when he issued that ultimatum, and he opted instead for a peace treaty with East Germany as a lever to remove the Western allies from Berlin. He had repeatedly postponed his own deadlines and allowed Kennedy several months to formulate a new U.S. position. But now, Khrushchev faced a great opportunity to intimidate the young president, who was just fresh off of this disaster in Cuba, and force a settlement on Berlin. Khrushchev himself was under a lot of pressure from hardliners in his own government, the Chinese, which we know didn't have a great relationship with the Soviets, and Khrushchev's own political instincts. He hadn't reached the pinnacle of Soviet power yet, which he wanted to do. Kennedy was a little bit startled at how vehemently Khrushchev demanded 
that we remove ourselves from Berlin. And Kennedy countered with an argument that America was in West Berlin not because of force, but because of the agreement that had been signed way back at the Yalta Conference in 1945. Kennedy saw Moscow's desire to alter the balance of power was very disturbing and dangerous. Khrushchev proposed a limited compromise in the form of an interim accord, which the superpowers would have to indicate their intent to turn the problem over to the Germans. But Kennedy knew that that could undermine U.S. credibility if he accepted that type of a bargain, especially after what had just happened at the Bay of Pigs, and therefore Kennedy refused any of these limited compromises that Khrushchev was throwing out there. So therefore, the conversation over Berlin turned downright ugly. Khrushchev said that he wanted peace and that Kennedy wanted war, which shows you the tone of what these accusations were. Kennedy responded to these accusations and said that the Soviets were the ones who were responsible for forcing change. Kennedy actually said, quoting, the calamities of war will be shared, by, will be shared equally. And so therefore, the Soviet Premier Khrushchev here vowed to sign a treaty with East Germany by December of 1961 unless JFK accepted some type of an interim, interim agreement. Kennedy said, if that's true, it's going to be a cold winter, therefore showing that he wasn't going to give in to the Soviet demands over Berlin. So he kept in line with what Eisenhower and what Truman had done before him, and as far as standing up to the Soviets when it came to the issue of Berlin. We simply were not going to abandon the West Berlin people or our position in West Berlin whatsoever. So pretty much the outcome and lessons of this summit meeting were pretty bad. Kennedy was a little bit dismayed by his inability to persuade Khrushchev of our determination and resolved. And he knew that after what happened at the Bay of Pigs that the U.S. had to respond firmly to any type of a challenge over Berlin. But he didn't know how much firmness would pr produce an acceptable result. Khrushchev came back from Vienna certain that Kennedy was no match for him. I mean, he considered him young, reckless, weak because of what happened with the Bay of Pigs. And basically, uh, Khrushchev was not very in a good position to be sympathetic towards Kennedy whatsoever. While Khrushchev thought Kennedy to be young and immature, he also saw some belligerence in Kennedy. And that kind of puzzled Khrushchev a little bit because even though the Bay of Pigs turned out bad for the United States, it didn't risk war with the Soviet Union. But a confrontation over Germany and Berlin might do that, which was something that was a scary proposition. So within a couple months after this meeting ended in an ominous way, the Berlin Wall began to be constructed. Obviously, you can see that the tensions were high. Both the United States and the Soviets began a military buildup on both of their sides of Germany. Back from before, after the first Berlin blockade that failed in 1948 when we airlifted supplies to the people of West Berlin, there was a constant stream of refugees from not only East Berlin but also the eastern parts of Germany trying to escape into the West. This was bad for the Soviets on a variety of levels. It made them look bad um, publicly, you know, as far as perception. It was bad for their economy because some of these people that were escaping to the West were the, the best trained and the most intelligent people that could be helpful for trying to build up industry in East Germany. The Soviets desperately wanted to stop this tide of refugees that were fleeing from East to West. Ever since the end of the blockade, people basically could go from one part of Berlin to the other simply by walking through the Brandenburg Gate, which was in the center of the city. 40,000 East Berliners crossed every day to and from jobs in West Berlin. It was pretty much a hole in the Iron Curtain through which many passed. And like I said, most of these people were some of the most talented people in East Germany. More than 2.5 million people had used this escape hatch since 1949, which is when Stalin called off the blockade. There were a couple of U.S. Senators by the name of Mike Mansfield and J. William Fulbright who realized that the Soviets could easily close this gap in their border and do so without breaking any written agreement with the U.S. And that obviously was not something that we wanted to see happen, this border cutoff. Meanwhile, the man in charge of East Germany's government, a man by the name of Walter Ulbricht, was continually pressing Khrushchev for permission to build a permanent barrier between East and West Berlin because he knew of this problem. On July 31st of 1961, Ulbricht suggested that air corridors from Berlin to West Germany should be cut in order to keep the refugees from leaving. Khrushchev rejected this, fearing that it could lead to war, but he agreed finally to let Ulbricht seal the border with barbed wire. If the West did not try to break through, the wire could be replaced by a wall. So construction began at midnight on August 12th. 
The first news reached Washington six hours later, which has showed you how bad communications was at that time. The U.S. response was just basically silence at first. We had feared that the Soviets would try to renew you know, some type of border restriction ever since the failed blockade in 1948. But we were not prepared for the possibility that West Berlin would be isolated from the East rather than from West Germany. Kennedy's advisors urged him to show restraint and pointed out the obvious propaganda propaganda advantages that Ulbricht had handed to the United States, and we could show how terrible the East German government was to do this to the people of Berlin. The president made no comment on the subject for an entire week, and his critics complained that he should have ordered American forces to destroy the barrier before it hardened into a wall, which started happening about three days after the wire was strung. His defenders said that that action could have led to an outright war. Neither seemed to consider that if the wire was cut, the East Germans could simply resisting it or else string it inside the border so the Americans would have to invade in order to cut it. Really, there wasn't a U.S. response that could have prevented the completion of the Berlin, Berlin Wall without coming to terms with Moscow and withdrawing from West Berlin. And there's no reason to believe that this was contemplated at the time. The Berlin Wall actually had benefits to both sides. It didn't solve the German question, but it diffused it. Khrushchev was able to stem the flow of the East German refugees and to su you know, suppress his critics who had pressured him to deal with Berlin. And at the same time, the West got a propaganda advantage from this very visible symbol of communism. Kennedy could now breathe easier because he knew now that Khrushchev knew our resolve to not leave Berlin and it showed that we could come to a compromise even though this was very bad for the people of Berlin there were literally people who got trapped on one side or the other because that's how quickly the barbed wire was put in place and then the wall and these people were then separated from family members and left stranded they could not get back to where they had came from people resorted in Berlin to digging of tunnels trying to establish some type of communications the Soviets cut phone lines it was terrible for the people of Berlin but at least for the superpowers it offered a somewhat temporary resolution at least for the German problem that just couldn't seem to be solved the Berlin Wall was one of the few Cold War milestones that could actually benefit both sides, even though, once again, the people are the ones who suffer the most, as in any war, whether it's Korea, Vietnam, or in this case, Berlin.